Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Our speaker this evening is a native of England. He is director of book publishing at the Augustan Institute and editor of the St. Austin Review. The internationally acclaimed author of many books, which include bestsellers such as The Quest for Shakespeare, Tolkien, Man and Myth, and The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, Joseph Pierce is a world-recognized biographer of many Christian literary figures. His books have been published and translated into Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, Italian, Korean, Mandarin, Croatian, and Polish. Pierce has hosted two 13-part television series about Shakespeare on EWTN and has also written and presented documentaries on EWTN on the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He has participated and lectured at a wide variety of international and literary events at major colleges and universities in the United States, Canada, Britain, Europe, Africa, and South America. And it is a pleasure to welcome back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Mr. Joseph Pierce. Welcome, Joseph. Good to have you with us tonight. It's wonderful to be with you. The Institute of Catholic Culture is such an inspiration. and I feel so honored and privileged to be, uh, to be part of you, at least on, on occasion. So it's good to be back for this first of two lectures on Chesterton's The Everlasting Man. And uh, Father Hezekiah actually showed, held the book up. This is actually the book I will be uh, reading passages from. So if you actually have the one that Father Hezekiah uh, held up, which is the Ignatius Press edition, when I give page references, you'll be able to actually to, to find it. If you have another edition, good luck. Um, so before, um, before I get into the text of the work, um, I want to say something about the background to The Everlasting Man, because there's a whole saga behind the writing of this book, which is actually very interesting. And it begins with the beginning of the publication uh, of H.G. Wells's book, The Outline of History, which began to appear in installments from 1920 onwards. And H.G. Wells is basically uh, uh, an atheist, a scientistic believer in progress, uh, a Darwinian, and very anti-Christian, in fact, anti-all religion. And so his outline of history, I mean, it's a masterful work in many ways in, in, in the fact that he he covers the whole terrain from from the ancient world to, to, to modern times. But of course, it's it's permeated uh, and poisoned and polluted by the materialistic philosophy, which informs it. So when it began to be published, it was hugely uh, popular. Uh, it was a bestseller. And Hilaire Belloc, G.K. Chesterton's great friend, Hilaire Belloc, um, began to write responses to uh, Wells's outline of history, and he actually wrote a book called A Companion to H.G. Wells's outline of history, in which he basically ripped Wells's arguments apart in Belloc's bellicose fashion. Uh, very learned, not necessarily always charitable. Uh, Wells responded with a book called Mr. Belloc Objects, to which Hilaire Belloc responded with a second book called Mr. Belloc Still Objects. So there's four books, two from Wells, two from Belloc, going back and forth about what is the true outline of history. You have Wells's atheistic perspective and Belloc's Catholic perspective. Um, it's into the midst of all of this that Chesterton enters the fray, because the, out, the, the everlasting man is Chesterton's outline of history. It's Chesterton's response to H.G. Wells, except that you would not know it, except for the prefatory note when he references Wells, but even then doesn't state explicitly this is a response. Um, but this is Chesterton's response and repost to Wells done with the utmost clarity and charity. This is Chesterton practicing what he preached, which is to always argue but never quarrel. 
Belloc, uh, when Chesterton died, Belloc wrote a, a, a booklet called On the Place of Gilbert Keith Chesterton in English Letters, in which he said that Chesterton did not always win arguments because he didn't go for the kill. But then Belloc said, but then he's in heaven. In other words, Chesterton got his priorities right. Um, I should say, by the way, before we move on to the everlasting man, as for Wells himself, his optimistic belief in the golden age in the future that will be heralded by science, this progressivist agenda, uh, meant that he was very credulous and naive. So, for instance, he visited uh, the Soviet Union under the rule of Joseph Stalin, which was responsible for the direct murder of tens of millions of its own citizens and the uh, incarceration of tens of millions of others in what Solzhenitsyn would call the Gulag Archipelago. In the 1934, at the height of the purges, at the height of Stalin's murder regime, H.G. Wells got a guided tour of the Soviet Union, just obviously seeing what they wanted him to see. And he was just um, fawning at this wonderful man, Stalin, and this glorious, happy future that the Soviet experiment was, was, was bringing into being. But then, of course, the horrors began to seep out. Even the naive, credulous socialists who wanted to believe it couldn't believe it any longer. Uh, and on top of that, we have the horrors of World War II and then the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all of which uh, exploded H.G. Wells's optimism into fragmented despair. And Wells's last book was called The Mind at the End of Its Tether. So it, Wells at least woke up through the horrors of the reality of the scientific, scientific progressivism and materialism and atheism of communism and national socialism um, to, uh, to the realities that they, that they actually heralded. But the power of his book was such that a certain young lady, when she was a teenager, I think only about 13 years old, though I haven't double checked that fact tonight, but when she was a teenager, a certain young lady in the United States called Joy Davidman read the outline of history by um, H.G. Wells and instantly, instantaneously, having read it, became an atheist. Now, sad to say, that was probably the impact of Wells's book on many others, which is why Belloc's and Chesterton's response was so important. Those of you that know your literary history will know who Joy Davidman is. She would become later Joy Gresham. And later still, she would become Mrs. C.S. Lewis. Um, and what's very interesting is that Joy Davidman read the outline of history and became an atheist. And C.S. Lewis read The Everlasting Man and became a Christian. Um, Chesterton, Lewis actually said that when he read, this is in 1925, when, when Chesterton's book was first published, when I read the, uh, the Everlasting Man, I saw the Christian outline of history laid out before me for the first time in a way that made sense. And had Chesterton heard those words, which he wouldn't have done because this was published, these words were published after Chesterton died, um, he would have been very heartened because that was exactly what he was aiming and trying to do in the writing of this book. So that's the background. H.G. Wells makes, makes Joy David an atheist. G.K. Chesterton makes C.S. Lewis a Christian. And then C.S. Lewis makes Joy Davidman a Christian. It's what we might call a happy ending. All right, let's get into the book. The book is, the, it is, the, is the, divided into two halves. Um, the first part of the book um, is on the creature called man, and it begins with the first chapter of that part, the man in the cave. And part two of the book is on the man called Christ, so on the creature called man, and then on the man called Christ. First part, first chapter of the first part, the man in the cave. The second, the first chapter of the second part, the God in the cave. And whereas uh, Wells was this sort of we start in the primeval soup of nothing. We all, we're all barbarians and primitives, and slowly we get more and more 
uh, enlightened uh, until this golden age in the future. For Chesterton, Jesus Christ and his incarnation and his death and resurrection is at the center of history. All of history prior to Christ points to his coming. All of the history since Christ points to his coming. It is the the is the 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 incarnation, the entry of God himself into his own story, history being his story it is at the center of history itself. This is Chesterton's thesis. OK, chapter seven, a prefatory note. And that would probably be prefatory note in England, but I'm now speaking with an American accent or at least an American intonation. And it happens to all of us in the end, especially those of you born here. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, the, the final few sentences of that prefatory note on, on page seven. As I have more than once differed from Mr. H.G. Wells in his view of history, it is the more right that I should here congratulate him on the courage and constructive imagination which carried through his vast and vivid and varied and immensely intensely interesting work but still more on having asserted the reasonable right of the amateur to do what he can with the facts which the specialists provide. Now, this is actually interesting. First of all, of course, this is very affable in its approach to Wells. It's not about enmity, but about amity. Um, Wells and Chesterton remain friends. Um, Wells and Belloc despised each other. Um, and but there, there is nonetheless a little bit of a backhanded compliment here because um, one of Belloc's attacks upon Wells is he did not know what he was talking about. He was a provincial school teacher who was acting as if he was the uh, the the uh, holder of all knowledge on the history of the world. Belloc had a first class honours degree from Oxford and had written many, many books of history. So he certainly was more qualified to discuss history than uh, H.G. Wells. So in one sense, Cheston is saying, well, you know, you're not uh, you're not an expert. But then he says, but what's wrong with that? Uh, and of course, Chesterton is not an expert either. In fact, Chesterton and Wells are about equally qualified to wax polemical, lyrical, wise uh, on on the history of the world. And of course, they're, they're, but through the fruits of their res research, they both knew a huge amount without being so-called experts. So having, if you said, given a, a deferential nod or, or bow to H.G. Wells, because this is Chesterton's response to him, we move into the text. On page 10, I'll give you some idea of where we are so those that want to follow can do so. So about two thirds of the way down the page. As for the general view that the church was discredited by the war, they might as well say that the ark was discredited by the flood. When the world goes wrong, it proves rather that the church is right. The church is justified not because her children do not sin, but because they do. OK, so. It was the, the time in which this book was being written was the time of the, what I called in my book, Literary Converts, the Wasteland Generation. It was the generation that was uh, the spokesman for it in many ways was T.S. Eliot with his poem, The Wasteland, published in 1922. And then uh, The Hollow Men, published, I think, in 1924. Um, so about that, you know, Chesterton's writing this book, 1924, 1925, exactly at this time. But of course, um, uh, and this epitomized the pessimism and the cynicism that emerged from the horrors of the trenches, what, what Tolkien called the animal horror of the, of the, of the Battle of the Somme. So there was this, this feeling that, well, that jingoism, that naive militaristic patriotism led to that horrific war, at the end of which, what actually was accomplished, apart from the fact that a, an enormous number of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. So, so in the midst of this, of course, this pessimism led, well, it's all the fault of Christianity. And of course, what Chester's saying here, no, it's like blaming Noah for the flood. It was the absence of Christianity. 
It was the rise of the, the, the secular militaristic Prussian state, which began with Bismarck. It's the secularist, um, uh, utilitarian, commercialist state of the British Empire. It's uh, the uh, post-revolutionary republic of France. In the midst of the war, of course, Russia uh, succumbs to the Bolshevik Revolution. This is not a Christian problem, except in the sense that it's the problem that's caused by the absence of Christianity. That's exactly what Chesterton's saying here um, as he sets off in his introduction. Okay, let's uh, move on. So he talks quite a bit in the, in the, in the introduction about sort of the, 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 the Darwinian understanding of, um, of humanity, about it's all being a development. And there's the origins of the universe and the origins of life and the origins of man. What Chesterton says is these origins are actually bigger than any so-called development. How the universe begin, began. How did nothing become something? That's the huge question that no one's answered. How did the inanimate something become life? That's the huge question that nobody's answered. How did the, the uh, life that had neither free will nor reason become man. These are the epochal moments in history that have never been discussed. I once said to my students, actually, I think you might have been either discussing the everlasting man or orthodoxy. I said to my students, um, in what sense is each of us bigger and more powerful than the sun. And the sun is obviously hugely powerful. You know, uh, it, 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 it's used by various people as an image of God because it's the light by which we see everything else. Right? It's the power by which we have any power. So it's an, an, an analogous metaphor for God himself. But how are we bigger than that? Well, it doesn't matter how big and how hard it is. It's an inanimate object. I can look at the sun. The sun can't look at me. I can measure how far I am from the sun. The sun can't measure how far I am from it. I can work out. I can't, but other people have. Yeah, how long it takes light to get from the sun to me. The sun can't work out how long it takes light to get from it to me so that it can see me because it can't see me. I can write a sonnet to the sun. The sun can't write anything. So in that sense, who we are as human beings is larger than the physical cosmos. Because we're spirit and we're made in the image of God. This is where Chester's getting at right at the beginning here. One of my favorite chapters in the book is the first chapter, chapter 28. Sorry, page 28, chapter one. And I'm going to read him because that is best. He's just great. So this is the new paragraph on page 28. In fact, people have been interested in everything about the caveman except what he did in the cave. Now, there does happen to be some real evidence of what he did in the cave. It is little enough, like all the prehistoric evidence. But it is concerned with the real caveman and his cave and not the literary caveman and his club. And it will be valuable to our sense of reality to consider quite simply what that real evidence is and not to go beyond it. What was found in the cave was not the club, the horrible gory club notched with the number of women it had knocked on the head. The cave was not a blue beard's chamber filled with the skeletons of slaughtered wives. It was not filled with female skulls all arranged in rows and all cracked like eggs. It was actually filled with art. And this is the point. Let's actually be scientific and not scientistic about who we were 
tens of thousands of years ago. There's no evidence that cavemen went around beating their wives on their head. The only evidence for that is a basically uh, uh, an arrogant, prideful and prejudiced attitude to the, towards the primitives who lived in the past and therefore making up stories about them that fit our pride and prejudice. The actual scientific evidence is that they actually went to the caves in order to draw and paint figures of men and figures of animals. And Chesterton was a trained artist before he became a writer. And he said, he said not just artists, but good artists. He talks about the sweep of the head of the antelope is being pursued by the hunter, the sense of movement, and then the sense of the movement of the line of the artist in depicting that. And he says, we don't even know from the evidence they lived in caves. They might have gone to the caves and that might have been their art gallery. Somewhere where they can actually draw things. They probably lived in wooden houses that would not have lasted 50,000 years. So there's no evidence of them. So this is one of the problems of scientific and arrogant uh, ways of looking at history. You only have a few pieces of the puzzle and you make the few pieces of the puzzle the whole puzzle. And then, you, and then you draw false conclusions about the whole puzzle because you're ignoring all the missing pieces. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the cave. I don't like leaving the cave, man, because uh, it's one of my favorite parts. But um, middle of page 32, though, there's a way of saying goodbye to the caveman. The pictures do not prove even that the caveman lived in caves any more than the discovery of a wine cellar in Balham. Balham is a part of South London, for those that don't know. The pictures do not prove even that the caveman lived in caves any more than the discovery of a wine cellar in Balham, long after that suburb had been destroyed by human or divine wrath, would prove that the Victorian middle classes lived entirely underground. The cave might have had a special purpose like the cellar. So don't draw universal conclusions upon partial evidence, basically. Um, I don't want to, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to leave this because it's good. I mean, look, top of page 34, Chestnut is best. Art is the signature of man. You know, what makes us different We're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God in the sense that we can love, we can uh, freely choose as a rational uh, choice to lay down our lives for someone else, including our enemy. In other words, we have free choice, free will, uh, and to sacrifice ourselves, which is uh, not, we're not slaves to um, instinct. We are we can reason we can write a sonnet to the sun or we can measure how far the sun is from us in terms of light years or light minutes. Um, but we can also create things. I was talking to say we can't create because the only one who can create is God who creates ex nihilo from nothing. We create things from other things that already exist. But as an artist, as a creator, it's our signature as man, which means it's actually we're signing ourselves as being made in the image of God. All right. Let's look at page 42 now. Leaving loads of quotes aside here, by the way, because we could have a whole course on this. And we don't have the time for that, unfortunately. It's one of the good things about heaven. Nobody have to worry about time there. Nor the uh, inertia. Uh, of time, which we call boredom. That won't exist either because it's all part of the fallen cosmos. No inertia, no ennui, just joy. Um, the middle of page 42. Anyhow, those bones are far too few and fragmentary and dubious to fill up the whole of the vast void that does in reason and reality lie between man and his bestial ancestors, if they were his ancestors. On the assumption of that evolutionary connection, a connection which I'm not in the least concerned to deny. So two things here. 
Chesterton is skeptical about Darwinian evolution. Belloc was dismissive of it. Uh, but he's basically saying it's irrelevant to me whether you know we got from being um, an ant to being a man by a process of all sorts of uh, hugely unlikely in terms of probability mutations or whether we got here by some other means. It's irrelevant to his thesis. But an assumption of that evolutionary connection, a connection which I am not in the least concerned to deny, the really arresting and remarkable fact is the comparative absence of any such remains recording that connection at that point. In other words, the missing link. The thing about the missing link is it's missing. The sincerity of Darwin really admitted this. In other words, Darwin himself said, well, you know, we haven't found the missing link. We can presume it exists, but we haven't found it. But the dogmatism of Darwinians, as opposed to the humility of Darwin, the sincerity of Darwin, has been too strong for the agnosticism of Darwin. And men have been sensibly fallen into turning this entirely negative term into a positive image. So the fact that the missing link has not been found has become a god that we worship. And what's very interesting here is we're now almost a century further on in scientific progress since Chesterton's time. And the missing link is still missing. More than that, um, that scientists have done everything in their power to try to make evolution work. Now, bear that in mind, of course, that scientists playing God, but not relying on the accident anymore. We're trying to make the accident happen. Um, but after a century of experimentation with fruit flies to make them become something other than the fruit fly, we have very large fruit flies, fruit flies that can't fly, fruit flies that are allergic to fruit. Probably not, but it, it sounds good. Um, but anyway, they're just mutant fruit flies, right? They're still fruit flies. They're not anything else. And my microbiologist friends, and I have a few, um, say that it's more than that. Even the most primal uh, life forms, such as bacteria, they have not managed to make one type of bacteria evolve or turn or mutate into another type of bacteria. So the point is that since Chesterton's time, They've been trying to find the missing link. And in fact, they've been trying to make the missing link, try to make it happen, whether it even happened in, in history. They're going to make it happen artificially in the laboratory, and they haven't been able to do it. OK. Yeah, page 43 here, towards the bottom, about 10 lines from the bottom, 12 lines from the bottom. In short, the prehistoric period need not mean the primitive period in the sense of the barbaric or bestial period. It does not mean the time before civilization or the time before arts and crafts. It simply means the time before any connected narratives that we can read. This is absolutely brilliant science, which is missing from all the chronological snobbery the scientific progressive views of history, which H.G. Wells is just a type. Their, their, their name is Legion. All that prehistory means is we do not have any remaining documentary evidence. Now, I have behind me here, uh, Bering, Belloc, further down Chesterton books. Some of them are first editions. I'm not a first edition collector, but many of them are published, you know, in the first 30 years of. Of this, um, of this century, I don't have the money to have uh, my whole house dehumidified like a museum, nor do I have the inclination to want to. And since I've owned these 30 or so years, some of them, perhaps that I've owned them, I can see them deteriorating. The spine is going, there's, there's foxing. That's 30 years. In other words, you go far enough back, the further back you go, the less evidence there's going to be of the, the jigsaw puzzle, which is history. And the only person who sees every piece in the puzzle is God. Every piece of the puzzle in every generation, God sees. But for us who live in one particular time, we don't see the piece of the puzzle in the future at all, except in our imagination, that may be inaccurate. But the, in the past, yeah, the piece of the puzzle from yesterday is still pretty much there. Those of 100 years ago, with, with enough evidence, most of it's still there. Well, that's not necessarily true. 
I don't know much about my ancestors. But you go back 10,000 years, how many pieces of the puzzle are still there? And let's not presume because we don't have pieces of the puzzle, there was no civilization or no writing. The fact that the notebooks written 30,000 years ago no longer exist does not mean there were no such thing as notebooks. Chesterton here is being precisely logical. Let's go on to like page 58. Because there were, I, I wrote something for, probably, I think, the Imaginative Conservative a few months or years, who knows, some time back, um, called What is Civilization? And I said, you know, there were two, two the definition of civilization on, on uh, Wikipedia um, is that basically it's all about complexity and taxation and big government. And I said, well, that's civilization. It can go to hell. And in fact, it's already going there. But there's other ways of seeing civilization, such as Christendom, right, whereby people live in accordance to an ethical value and they prize the good and the true and the beautiful and they produce great art. Two different ways of seeing civilization. Chesson is using the first here just by way of making a point. So about eight lines from the bottom of page 58. But the despotism in certain dingy and decayed tribes in the 20th century, I love that, dingy tribes in the 20th century, you'd have to go very far back in the past to find this, does not prove that the first men were ruled despotically. Does not even suggest it. Does not even begin to hint at it. If there is one fact we really can prove from the history that we really do know, is that despotism can be a development, often a late development, and very often, indeed, the end of societies that have been highly democratic. A despotism may almost be defined as a tired democracy. A fatigue, as fatigue falls on a community, the citizens are less inclined for that eternal vigilance, which has truly been called the price of liberty. I mean, look at the despotism of communism or the despotism of Nazism. It's the decaying fruit of a couple of centuries of decadent enlightenment philosophy. And it's only possible by an in an industrialized society. Building theories are upon industrialism. These despotisms are a consequence of the complexity of civilization. So despotism is not something that belongs to the primitive. Of course, you can have a tyrant in a family, right? So, um, but the, the Chester's point is that, that despotism can be a consequence of too much progress and not just a question of barbarism. Um, let's move on to page 60. about uh, a third of the way down, the familiarity which in men is called tradition or the experience which is in men is called wisdom. If some ritual of seniority keeps savages reverencing somebody called the old man, then at least they have not our own servile sentimental weakness for worshiping the strong man. Now think about this. A primitive society is proved to be primitive by actually showing deference and reverence to the old man who's been around for 70 years and has witnessed and experienced a great deal. That apparently is primitive. We actually live in a culture that worships the young man. Right. That basically you, you, you reach the peak of everything there is to know when your loins start working. Uh, and then you spend the rest of your life worshipping your loins. It's the worship of youth, the worship of a teenager. Is that actually more wise or more civilized or more advanced than showing deference and reverence to the old man who's been living for 70 years? I can tell you a few things about what he's experienced, not least the stupid mistakes you're currently making as a 20 year old, which he did himself when he was 20. 
But here, it's not just the young man. Of course, the cult of the teenager hadn't arrived when Chesterton wrote this. But the cult of the strong man had. And in some sense, this is prophetic. 1925, um, we have Mussolini in Italy, the fascist leader. He's in power. Hitler, though, is not yet in power. Um, Stalin is not yet the, 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 the force he's going to be. But the strong man, what Hitler, Hitler can see it coming because of the philosophy of Nietzsche and the worship of the Ubermensch over the Untermensch, the Superman over the subhuman. He can see it coming, although he's writing this eight years before Hitler comes to power. And what is more barbaric, the primitive reverence for the old man or the ultra modern worship of the strong man? And remember, Wells, nine years later, sitting at the knee of Joseph Stalin, the progressive dupe. All right. What else do I have to skip for the times we have left? Let's go on to page 87. The bottom of page 87. They are obsessed by their evolutionary monomania that every great thing grows from a, a seed or something smaller than itself. They seem to forget that every seed comes from a tree or from something larger than itself. Now, there is very good ground for guessing that religion did not originally come from some detail that was forgotten because it was too small to be traced. Much more probably, it was an idea that was abandoned because it was too large to be managed. Again, literally, Chester's asking the, the uh, proverbial question here, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? The evolutionist insists dogmatically that the egg comes first and the chicken comes afterwards, which, of course, begs the question, who laid the egg? So did man invent God? Or was God always there and man has drifted away from him because God makes demands upon man that uh, are inconvenient? And if man drifts away from God for long enough, he forgets. And he only has fragments and pieces which become heresies and new religions. Just as suggesting that we have the one truth that decays and fragments into the many rather than all these little seeds of superstition that grow into something bigger. And I will say one thing here, by the way, that, um, no, I won't, because I'm going to talk about it later. Um, let's go to page 106. The challenge of this, by the way, see, if you're in a classroom and you have 17 weeks, shall we say, um, you could take your time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, if you've got two hours, um, it's not quite so simple to know what to leave out and what to continue to leave in and then to what extent I should wax on them and to what should I should let Cheston do his own speaking. But I've just let Cheston do his own speaking. You may as well just be reading the book. So you'd have to listen to me a little bit. So page 106, about 10 lines up from the bottom. The poet feels the mystery of a particular forest, not of the science of a forestation or the department of woods and forests. He worships the peak of a particular mountain, not the abstract idea of altitude. So we find that God is not merely water, but often one special river. Here we have actually something very important. The difference between the poet and, for want of a better word, the scientist, or the, 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 the difference between things and abstractions. When he talked about worshipping the mountaintop there, regardless of whether, obviously, the Greeks with Olympus, but we can get a Christian example. Those of you that don't know this poem, it's your homework. Um, 
Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, um, uh, which I'm not going to remember the, the name of, about Mont Blanc, um, Him Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix. Um, that is the, the poet who's a Christian is not worshipping the mountaintop. He's seeing the mountaintop as something which shines forth epiphanously the beauty and glory and majesty and presence of God. And what Chesterton suggests in various parts of this book, a lot of the time when they're so-called worshipping the mountain, they're not worshipping the mountain. They're reverencing the mountain, perhaps as a God, but not as the God. And even in Homer, when you're going back almost as far as we, we can in terms of certainly written uh, um, history, certainly literary history. Um, it's clearly that the lesser gods are not God. The extent to which Homer is God is a, is a, is a, is a good discussion, which we don't have time for. Um, or the extent to which Homer is at least a pro, uh, so Zeus, I mean, not Homer, Zeus. The extent to which Zeus is God and the other gods are, are not gods uh, and, and lesser gods, but to the extent to which Zeus is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, these, these divine attributes that the Greek philosophers a few centuries later would be uh, um, musing upon. You know, even Homer is asking these questions. But what does uh, Plato and Aristotle and St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas tell us? Well, Aquinas tells us we want to connect. We want to be actually get in close connection with reality. We actually have to begin with humility, with a virtue humility, which gives us a set, the sense of gratitude, which is necessary for opening our eyes in wonder. And when we open our eyes in wonder, we then see things um, in a way which moves us to contemplation. And that in, in, in Latin, dilatatio, the opening of the mind and the heart and the soul into the fullness of reality. That's, what's, and that's exactly what's happening with Coleridge in that poem, your homework. Him before sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix, that he is basically through his humility and the sense of gratitude for what he's seeing, he's lifted up in contemplation that his mind and heart opens to the fullness of the presence of God. Now, can that be done with abstractions? Possibly, if you're a mathematician, I don't know. But I do know that the script that scripture talks about things and stories and people rather than abstraction. You would hear Christ talking to us about the prodigal son. You won't hear, it, hear him um, discoursing on the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So the difference between the poet and the scientist, by the way, which doesn't mean, <laughs> well, let me say one other thing here because it is relevant and then I'm probably going to stop here for, for, for this week. It's not, we haven't done too badly actually because the first part is two thirds of the book almost. So I wasn't expecting to finish the first part. But I want to leave time for questions. Um, so I'll probably finish here. The, the other reason, by the way, just as a way of whetting your appetite, <laughs> immediately after this, I'm going to argue with Chesterton. There's a point, there's something, something in the book I disagree with him about. Um, and uh, I don't want to rush the argument because uh, it's difficult enough to argue with, Chester, argue with Chesterton. I give myself enough time to make my case. So we'll probably begin uh, next week's class with my arguing with just an aspect of Chesterton. Um, Chesterton said, we talk about his relationship with his brother. He argued, but he never um, quarreled. Um, so I, I just basically want to to um, conclude uh, this evening with just what Chesterton's doing here is asking the necessary radical questions. And radical from the Latin radix, right? The questions that are the root of the problem. Instead of making certain suppositions or assumptions based upon the prejudices that based upon pride, let's actually get back to the basics. You know, the caveman, well, what do we know about the caveman? Let's look at the evidence. And then just start asking other fundamental questions. What did come first, the chicken or the egg? Why do we presume the egg came first? Um, so the, so the, there's, a, there's a real, Chesterton at his best in this, where he is doing something that he urges us to do. That if you want to see things for the first time, 
as they really are, you have to stand on your head. And the reason for that is that you might have been standing on your head for the whole of your life. And without having the humility to see it afresh for the first time, you will think the upside down view of things is the right side up view of things. So try it. The paradox of life. And of course, what, what he's talking about there ultimately is conversion. And one thing that Chester's doing in this book is trying to convert those who might have been perverted by H.G. Wells, his book, The Outline of History. But also, I think, because Chesterton works on the personal level of the poet and not the abstract level of the scientist, I think he's trying to convert H.G. Wells. Um, he may not have been successful, but it was certainly a noble, noble endeavor and worth the effort. And of course, we are all beneficiaries of the fruits of that noble labor. And at that point, I'm going to stop for today. We'll begin next week with an, uh, uh, my little argument with Chesterton, which I should then probably say mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa immediately afterwards. And then we'll get on to the, even more of the great stuff of the everlasting man. Thanks so much, everybody. If you have questions, I'll be hanging around to take them. Keep them easy. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph Pierce, for being with us tonight. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, and I'm sure we'll all be returning next week for the second part. Mr. Pierce, you were referencing page numbers for a particular edition of The Everlasting Man. Do you mind holding that up and sharing with us what that is for those who might want to try to procure it in the next week or get it and rewatch your lecture? Yeah, I did see a question in the chat as well, which is probably cheating because they weren't supposed to do that about what should we read for next week? And obviously it's a two part lecture on the book. So if it's possible for you to read the remainder of the book by next week, because that's what I'll be covering. Obviously I won't be covering all of it, but that's what I'll be picking from. So this is it. This is the Ignatius Press edition of the Everlasting Man. That's what the cover looks like. They put, well, I know they probably have more than one edition. Ignatius Press publishes 5 million books. Um, this is the uh, 1993 uh, edition by looks of it. But anyway, there we go. All right, thank you so much. Let's see if we have, do we have any questions here from our video participants of Mr. Pierce? Yes, Dr. Pepino. Right, yes, just a quick question regarding the, the, the impact of um, this astounding conversation really, the three-way conversation between Wells, Belloc and Chesterton at the time. Was it a big fracas in the newspapers? And was it followed by um, conversions or abandonments of the faith at the time in Britain in the 20s, in the same way, say, that the Oxford movement and the conversion of Newman in his day caused a fracas and also influenced many young Britons uh, to convert? Great, great question. Um, first of all, as regards the media attention of the, of the fracas, um, a great deal. Uh, uh, Wells's book was an international bestseller. Um, Belloc, if you like, rode that wave and he probably sold quite a few books. That wasn't his motivation, but that was uh, 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 probably no doubt a very pleasant byproduct. Um, but one good thing about that from the Catholic perspective it was really uh, the publication of Chesterton's uh, Belloc's two books, uh, Reposting uh, Wells, that, that helped through the sales of those books, helped to launch a, a new Catholic publisher, uh, which we all know, or many of us will know, as Sheedon Ward. So Sheedon Ward then did marvelous work for, well, the rest of the century. Uh, but it was basically, they, they were launched, I think, in 1925. And these books by Belloc were either the first or some of the first titles they published. They were hugely successful. And they put Sheed and Ward on the map. So that's certainly a factor there. There's no doubt at all that the outline of sanity by Wells uh, added to the atmosphere of skeptical and cynical agnosticism come atheism that was uh, pervasive in the interwar years. And yet, of course, one consequence of that, which you know, we, we always need to be aware of, is that once the atmosphere becomes pervasive, it's great territory for evangelization. And Chesterton and Belloc and others were very um, successful 
in those interwar years in bringing converts into the church. And I'm actually right, finishing a book now on the history of Catholic England. And between the end of World War One and I think 1926, so exactly this period, there were on average uh, more than uh, 10,000 adult conversions to the faith every year, um, which are a population of England and, and, and you know the Catholic population being what it was is actually phenomenal. I don't know what the figures are now, but it'd be much smaller. So, uh, and again, as regards the strongman and fascism and communism and capitalism, the social teaching of the Catholic Church, which you know, derived from obviously ultimately the scriptures and, and St. Thomas and the rest, but particularly Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum, and then Pius, the, uh, Pius XI in 1931 with Anno, this uh, offering, and what Chesterton and Belloc called distributism, this offering um, a, a Christian Catholic alternative to fascism, Marxism, or what we would now maybe call globalism. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Oh, I see Adrian has a, a question. Go ahead and take yourself off mute, Adrian. So, Mr. Pierce, first of all, I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, and, but one thing I always struggle with is um, reading Chesterton. I enjoy reading him but I struggle to read him. I tried listening to The Everlasting Man on audiobook and I, it just, I couldn't follow it. And so I think I'd be better off reading it, but it was, it's a struggle. <laughs> it's a great question, Adrienne. I'm so pleased you asked it. And there's, there's various ways of answering it. First of all, the, most people these days expect someone to get to the point. Um, Chesterton seldom gets to the point. He <laughs> takes you for a walk. Uh, and he'll take you in all sorts of places that have nothing whatsoever apparently to do with the walk. Um, uh, so you'll get, you're getting frustrated if you want the answer to the question. You have to actually have the patience to perambulate. Uh, you have to just want to go for the walk and just enjoy the presence of Chesterton uh, going wherever he wants to take you. And he always does bring you back to the point but you must never be in a hurry, which in itself is a good thing. But I would also say that he does have a, a style, which is not for everybody. And I don't, I, I say this, you don't, it's not a mortal sin not to like or read Chesterton. So don't get hung up about it. Now, he, he has a certain writing style that's not for everybody. And the, the third way of answering it is the, is, is the way of answering which earns you some money, Adrian, I'm very pleased to say, because you'll get 10% commission on every copy of the book I'm about to promote. Um, <laughs> but you know, I do actually sometimes say that, the, that one of the best ways of being introduced to Chesterton is to read my biography, Wisdom and Innocence, A Life of G.K. Chesterton, because it does take you through Chesterton's person in the sense of, you know, from his childhood through to his death. But I quote, you know, copiously, um, extensively from his works as they were published, seeing them in the context of the culture in which they were written. So, you, and I've, obviously, I'm taking out the most salient ones that are going to be most, uh, you know, accessible, bite-sized chunks for a reader that's that's part of a, a bigger narrative. So, I'm not going to take you on one of the long walks because it's not going to work if I'm giving you a a 75-word quote. So. I, I'm saying it actually not just to sell copies of my book, but I'm like Belloc, I'm happy to have the byproduct. But I do actually think that um, my, my book, Wisdom and Innocence, The Life of G.K. Chesterton, is a very good introduction to Chesterton for those who are struggling with getting him, you know, uh, having him neat as opposed to on the rocks. Or with, or with tonic water even. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I love that image of kind of just going for a walk and... Uh... I think that's probably helpful if people approach it in that way. Um, I want to take this question coming in from Alexander. Alexander writes, in Chesterton's view, what are some of the major positive aspects of modern scientific progress? Despite its H.G. Wells type hubris, it seems to Alexander that at minimum, um, it's helped make the essentials of life easier to allow more time for contemplating God. Um, but did Chesterton see that or did he speak of, of any kind of positive side of it? 
Well, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I, that's another great question, by the way. I feel so privileged to be part of a group that asks questions of this nature. Um, but I'm going to answer uh, in, in my own Luddite voice before I answer in Chesterton's voice, which would be much less uh, abrasive. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, that modern technology allows us more time for contemplation may be true. Um, but for most of us, it allows us to spend time with our gadgets instead of our God, uh, to be distracted with our phones and with everything else and looking at screens all day long uh, and never actually having one moment's silence. Now, uh, that's, of course, that's, it doesn't mean we're not forced to do that, but I do think these things are addictive. I think distraction is addictive. Um, so uh, I remember having a conversation, uh, someone with actually uh, yesterday, Someone said, well, I'm happy for to have my washing machine because I would, wouldn't want to be down by the river, you know, beating the, the wood all day. I said, well, that's when all the women got together and chatted, right? They probably look forward to that every day, right? They get down there, talk to each other while they're at it. They're just doing something while they're doing it, right? And, and now they, they're doing that instead. I mean, what's preferable? So that's my Luddite voice. But now let me answer for Chesterton. I don't want Chesterton to take the blame for me. Um, one of the key things that Chesterton did for me, uh, which was necessary in my own conversion, I, I believed, as I think many modern people believe, that you have to choose between faith or reason, that you have to choose one or the other, that faith is obviously irrational, but may be comforting, and, and, and reason is, is uncomfortable, but perhaps real, right? Uh, and, and what Chesterton showed me, because he, of course he's following the tradition of Augustine and Aquinas and Socrates, that was Plato, Aristotle, is that fides et ratio, faith and reason, are indissolubly united. They're married, an indissoluble union. And it was that realization that actually, I don't have to abandon my reason to, to embrace faith. On the contrary, the more I employ my reason, the more I engage my reason, the closer I'm brought to faith. That's what Chesterton brought to me. And this is now where we have to get, take one step back, and what do we mean by science? Because we have to have an older understanding of the, of the word science from the Latin scientia. All that science means is knowledge, right? And, and, and so, so therefore science is good. Theology was called the queen of the sciences, right? Theology is a science, philosophy is a science, history is a science. What we now call science was once called natural philosophy. Philosophia, the love of wisdom to be learned from nature, right? That's what the physical sciences were. The wisdom we can learn from studying nature, which is, of course, a great thing. So the physical sciences are good, but they're only part of the picture. They're not the whole picture. And I think that's what Chesterton would insist upon. But he's certainly always in favor of science. And there's a big difference between science, which is good, and scientism, which is the worship of, of uh, materialistic progress in the name of science, which is not the same thing. Joseph, there's a great question coming in from Tim. He asks, how does Chesterton the poet inform Chesterton the philosopher and the apologist? Well, I'm gonna leave the apologist to one side at the moment because it's a slightly different question. But how does Chester the poet inform Chester the philosopher? I'm going to say there that that is exactly the issue I'm going to be arguing with Chester about next week. So, so thank you for that teaser. And please do come back next week so I can answer that question at greater length. All right, I see James raising his hand. James, go ahead. I wanted first, uh, Dr. Pierce, to thank you for your book on uh, uh, poems every Catholic should know. I picked up a copy of that and, and very much am enjoying my way through it. Uh, uh, also, with regard to Adrian's question earlier, I was really wowed with Everlasting Man when I read it probably 10 years ago. But I, some of uh, Chesterton's books are a little easier to work through than, than others. And what's your, in addition to your uh, book, which I haven't read yet, uh, what um, uh, what books of Chesterton do you suggest that people start with uh, to acclimate themselves to his style? Well, the first thing I would say, you don't actually have to go to Sacramental Confession for not reading my book on Chesterton, but I hope you feel guilty. Um, <laughs> um, 
But uh, the problem with that question is that every body, every person is unique. And thanks be to God for that. So uh, I could tell you my own personal favorites are because, but that, that that's because of who I am. So my favorite book by Chesterton, probably, well, I oscillate between the, the uh, his two novels, The Man Who Was Thursday and The Ball and the Cross, but that's because I'm a literature person, right? If you're a philosopher, you probably have a different answer. I can, so I, I, I think I'll answer maybe in two ways, uh, that, that three ways, the, third, the first way that I've just answered, purely subjectively. Um, but I'd also maybe talk in terms of the books I think are his best and most important. And then maybe the ones that's the first and the ones that may be more most accessible. OK, so his most important books, um, I think, are The Everlasting Man and Orthodoxy. They're his two great works of, uh, of apologetics. Um, his two works on St. Francis of Assisi and St. Thomas Aquinas are also very important. His poem, Lepanto, every Catholic should know, even though it's not in my book, and there's a reason for that, but that's another topic. Um, um, several other poems by Chesterton as well that would apply to. Um, but I think as regards accessibility, um, probably his essays, but only some of them. But thankfully, uh, Ignatius Press has published a, 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 a volume with the best of Chesterton's essays um, uh, called In, In Defense of Sanity. So the most, apart from reading my book, and also, by the way, Dale Olquist has done some great Chesterton 101, The, the Apostle of Common Sense. These are also very good introductions to Chesterton. But if you want to read Chesterton in the war, so to speak, uh, but don't want to dive in the deep end, uh, then probably in defense of sanity, the best essays of Chesterton by uh, Ignatius Press, I would recommend. Great, thank you. Um, also, I'm seeing some questions. I will include a link to Joseph Pierce's book um, in the follow-up email, as well as a link to the poem that he referenced, Coleridge's poem. So I'll include those in the follow-up email for those who are wondering. Um, continuing on the theme of, uh, uh, book recommendations or fittingness of reading. Um, we had some people writing in wondering, um, regarding the outline of history, would you recommend that somebody read that to, to get the context of the everlasting man? And then second question kind of related, um, are there certain ages that you think the everlasting man or a certain time in per a person's life that it would be good for them to read it? Would you recommend it for teenagers, for example? Okay, two great questions again. Um, I personally read the outline of sanity at when I was uh, um, a neo-Nazi <laughs> agnostic at the uh, recommendation of an atheist. And uh, I enjoyed it. And I, I do think it actually broadened my understanding of history. I probably knew nothing at all about Carthage, very little about ancient Greece. So the point is, if, you, if you're coming to, to history, uh, world history for the first time, it actually is a, a very good introduction from the perspective of the facts the problem is of course it's poisoned by the philosophy so you're you're, you're being poisoned without knowing it now i don't think i had a particularly bad in, in, well evidently not because of where i ended up but um uh that i i i, I don't to move on i don't think uh, that anybody should read the outline of history as a preparation for in the everlasting man i think that's that would be too much um, I do think that serious students of history that want to really get to grips with the uh, meta-historical narrative of, of the whole panoramic picture of civilization, insofar as that's possible. You know, to read Wells' is The Outline of History, uh, and then with Belloc's response, with the everlasting man, maybe the Christopher Dawson's works on history, uh, and then maybe throw in people like Oswald Spengler, you know, for the devil's advocate. You know, if you really want to get, if, you know, if you're studying history and you want to get deep, then yes, it should be part of um, a reading regimen. I think reading it by itself, I, I wouldn't really see the point. And certainly reading it as preparatory reason for the everlasting man, no. Great, thank you. And I'll just give a little plug here since we can that if you're serious about learning history, the ICC has just 
released self-paced courses given by Dr. Papino uh, to semester long courses in history. So each of those are about 20 part lectures, um, wonderful introduction to ancient and um, ancient history and history of the church. Um, just a follow up question, um, Joseph Pierce, would you recommend The Everlasting Man for teenagers or young yeah. adults or? Uh, again, they're, 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 teenagers come in many shapes and sizes. I mean, I, I've spoken over the years at many conferences um, and at Catholic homeschooling conferences, for instance, you know, I can have a little 10 year old girl or boy coming up to me, telling me that they've read The Lord of the Rings six times. All right. Um, now, when I was 10 years old, I just looking at a book that size would be enough to scare me. Um, and th those people are, of course, are exceptional. So I do think you know, that the art of, of parenting is to know your children. And that's one of the glories of without advocating homeschooling in a, in a, in a, in a dogmatic way, though we do homeschool. Um, uh, that, that the glory of homeschooling is that no one knows your children better than you do. And you can actually accommodate their needs and their requirements. Um, um, so there's no, there, the, in this sense, at least, as George Bernard Shaw said, it's not universally true. Uh, uh, the only golden rule is there is no golden rule. Um, so as regards, you know, whether people should be the everlasting man, I think it's true. Um, so for precocious youngsters who are already well read and are going to uh, be prompted to ask and answer the right questions, yes. For most 21st century American teenagers, they're going to be bemused, confused, and probably um, absolutely um, uh, apoplectic that you, you force them to spend any time at all with it. So probably not a good idea for most teenagers. Joseph, I've got a, a question for you about how Chesterton approached history and how we should read Chesterton, approach his writings. Um, what is the importance of, you know, your, your book is called The Wisdom and Innocence of Chesterton. What is the importance of having that kind of childlike innocence and, and humility when approaching the study of history? Uh, crucial. Uh, as, as I've tried to uh, point out this evening in quoting from Chesterton in The Everlasting Man, it's chronological snobbery. It's the presumption that the present, uh, which, is, you know, which is, is, is basically part of the philosophy of the progressive. The present is superior to the past because it's the present. The future will be superior to the present because it's the future. Well, that just means, I mean, it's actually very similar to the Nazi view that, you know, because I'm a German Aryan of the 1930s, of course I'm superior to those Slavs, right, and to those Africans and to those Mediterraneans, because I'm, an, I'm a, a Nordic Aryan from Germany, right? I mean, you know, if you can look down upon everybody else, but that's exactly what the chronological snobs do. And, and that's why they can't read history. The past is something which is inferior to them, which they can turn their noses up at and, and pass judgment on which is why the ideologies today are just going to cancel history. Because what, does, what do those primitive, subhuman people from the past have to teach us? Nothing. Right? Whereas in actual fact, we should love our neighbor, and that includes all of our neighbors that have lived and shared this um, communion of communication with us. Um, and it's that love of neighbor which we have to restore. And I think that's what Chesterton is trying to do in this. Look, let's not look on the past as something which is inferior. Let's look on the past as something where the people living in the past are our brothers and sisters, and that we may learn something from them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Joseph Pierce, for being with us this evening and for taking so many questions. Um, your answers have been very insightful and enlightening. So we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Well, thank you, Kelsey. The answers are only as good as the questions. Thanks be to God for the good question. Yes, I agree with that, certainly. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being with us this evening. Um, I'm so excited that this is a two-part lecture, so that we'll be together next week. Um, thank you again, Joseph Pierce. Um, I will be sending an email out to everyone with links to uh, the book and the poem. Um, hopefully, you'll have some time to read through that and maybe read through some more of The Everlasting Man before our lecture next week. All right, everyone. Well, thank you again. Um, I look forward to seeing you in one week. God bless everyone. And thank you again, Joseph Pierce. My pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. God bless. See you next week.